Thank you, Ian, for that welcome. And um, it's great to see everybody. It's nice to see a real live audience for the first time in a few years. Well, I assume you're still alive anyway, so hopefully after lunch you are still going to keep with me. Um, my presentation is going to focus on how the tax system in the UK can help and support you in your kind of green credentials. And having sat through the first, first half of this, I'm, I'm absolutely impressed already by what's happening and what's, and what's kind of going on. And I think you don't need me to kind of sweeten that pill, really, from a tax point of view. And obviously, every little does help. So I'm going to cover two areas. One is uh, capital allowances, and the other is research and development tax credits. Areas that I hope that you are broadly familiar with, although my, my role is not to make you a tax expert in the next 15 minutes, uh, you'll be relieved to hear. Um, I will obviously cover the issues that are relevant and pertinent. I can't go into too much detail, otherwise we'll still be here by the middle of next week. Um, so firstly, capital allowances then. So capital allowances is a way in which the tax system allows business and individuals to have a, effectively a tax relief for capital expenditure. So essentially look at it like a tax depreciation item. It, obviously, business accounts, you are pretty free to draw up your own accounting policies and your amortisation of fixed assets. But what the tax system does is put on a statutory base the percentage allowances that are available in certain categories. Without that, you could effectively do something, um, accelerate your tax relief completely on your own. You could write everything off in the first year, for example, and that would obviously give you a pretty an unfair um, playing field compared to other businesses. So the tax system very much um, subscribes rates of allowances. Now, whether they are allowances on buildings or they're on plant or they're on items of plant within buildings, there is a whole raft of legislation. There's a whole um, long list of allowances and percentage allowances that's available. So I won't obviously go into all those. Um, what we did have at the turn of the century, sounds a strange saying that now, but in 2001, the tax system was kind of trying to keep up as fast as possible with, with the developments in, in the commercial world. And we had the introduction of something called enhanced capital allowances. Now, um, this developed over a kind of a 10, 15 year period. And essentially, they were allowances focused on encouraging investment in green technology. So whether they were energy efficiency or they were kind of water conservation, whatever they were, that those policies were developing quite quickly. And I can remember advising clients who were either refurbishing commercial property or, or constructing commercial property. There was something called the carbon trust list. So if you were looking to put a piece of plant, say a boiler or a piece of um, water conservation equipment into a building, you could look with a manufacturer's name and model number, if it was on the carbon uh, trust list, then that would attract 100% first year allowance, i.e. a complete tax write-off in the year of expenditure, and therefore obviously an acceleration of, uh, of, of a tax relief and a reduction of, of, of tax payable. So it would be quite, quite possible in conversations I was having that, that clients were saying, I can have this boiler over here that's not on the list and it's probably a little bit cheaper, or I can have this boiler over here, which is on the list, is more expensive, and obviously comes with all of the efficiencies of running a more uh, eco-friendly system anyway. So on its own merit, it made sense to perhaps go for item two. But the tax system really drove you down that line to say this is the right thing to do from a tax planning point of view, a tax saving point of view. So with all of that and all that development between 2001 and, say, 2017, it was a real surprise, actually, when in 2018... The then Chancellor, um, it's a shame that BIM has gone now, but uh, it could, could have challenged him. But why Philip Hammond decided to withdraw those allowances and the kind of the, uh, the, the, the tax community pushed back on that to say, why wow, that seems like you're going against the flow of travel. And um, the reason back was well, actually the poorly targeted. Um, and most SMEs can get those reliefs anyway without having to go through a very narrow gateway to claim them. So those reliefs were effectively rolled rolled back um, and what we did have then coming into force with effect from April 21 is a new raft of, of kind of energy efficient focused equipment allowances primarily um, aimed at motor vehicles. So I think the, the rationale was plant a machine we can look after itself there are other allowances available anyway motor vehicles are the thing that don't really fall into the into the plant category 
And that really is where the biggest impact can be made from a government point of view. So what we had was the introduction of allowances for electric and zero um, cars. So what we're doing now in terms of the tax legislation is we're very much mirroring this concept of, of kilograms or grams, in this case, grams per kilometre driven. So if you, as a business or as an individual, are purchasing an electric vehicle or a, a car, a vehicle, a car that has zero grams per kilometre driven, then you are still able to attract 100% first year allowances. If the vehicle in question has a, um, a grams per kilometre between 1 and 50, then your expenditure would fall within the main pool. Uh, the significance of that is you get an 18% writing down allowance annually, so not the 100%, only 18%. And if you were over 50 grams per kilometre driven as a car, um, then you seem to be a bit of a gas guzzler and you fall into the special rate pool and tax allowances are only at the rate of 6% per annum writing down allowance, so significantly deferred in terms of the benefits available. There are other um, items on there as well. Um, obviously, electric vehicle charging points has now gone on that list, and there's a few other things that I'd probably suggest are of less significance, but never lost quite important. The reason I think that the kind of the Treasury came back on that Philip Hammond reversal was that Things like the annual investment allowance, which is effectively, again, 100% writing down allowance for qualifying items, has been extended repeatedly over the last few years, and it's now standing at a million pounds and will continue at that level for a further year until the end of March 2023. So you're kind of picking up those allowances on plant items anyway. That you can't get cars within the AIA, hence the different um, incentive being available. Many of you will also be aware of something called the super deduction, which sounds very exciting. Um, it was announced on the 3rd of March 2021, so it's its first birthday today, which was the day of the budget last year. Um, so for expenditure incurred between 1st of April 21 and 31st of March 23 for contracts signed after 3rd of March 21, then businesses are able for items that would fall into the main pool, so essentially plant and machinery, to pick up this enhanced deduction of 130%. If you're not within the main pool, but you're in the special rate pool, then there's some very detailed um, analysis as to which pool you fall in. If you need any help, please ask me. Um, you only pick up a 50% first year allowance, essentially. But those, uh, those two items, the super deduction and the 50% uh, the allowance, are only available for new and unused items of plant, unlike the AIA, which is available for second-hand items as well. But as I've said, they all exclude cars. So, little example really, if we've got a business, or again it can be a sole practitioner or a partnership, so effectively these, these capital allowances rules apply to both income tax and corporation tax. If, if I've got a company example here, so if a company is purchasing five new e-golfs, electric golfs, at £31,000 this year, that's an annual spend this year of £155,000. Because they are electric, then they uh, qualify for the 100% right, 100% first year allowance. So effectively, 155,000 pounds will be a deduction against the profits of the business, and at the current rate of corporation tax, which is 19%, but as you're probably aware, rising to 25% from April 23, that actually reduces your corporation tax liability by almost 30,000 pounds. If instead of buying a, an e-car you bought a car that had a admissions between that one and 50 grams per kilometre driven, then you'd be picking up the allowances in the second line in the 18% um, category, meaning that in year one, your reduction in your tax bill would be 5,300, and only even after four years, you still only had relief in cash terms of 16,000, which obviously is half of what you would have had in, in the first year had you bought electric. And not surprisingly, the situation gets worse for the, for the gas guzzler. It falls into the special rate pool, 6%, only getting a, a, a kind of a, a, a meagre £1,767 of cash saving in year one. And even after four years, you've only actually had £6,500 of benefit. So significantly deferring the cash benefit to the business. So obviously, clearly a driver from government to get us all into electric vehicles. Um, changing the behaviour of... of Businesses is one thing, changing the behaviour of company car drivers, employees, directors of company cars is another. And what you can see here, again, looking at the Golf or the petrol car, 
for broadly, broadly similar vehicles. Um, the, the petrol car retailing at about 25,000, benefit in kind calculation is worked out on the percentage of the retail price. So that is 29% uh, for this for tax year, actually is 20, I'm looking ahead now to so tax year 22, 23, starting next month. So the, um, the benefit in kind for a 40% taxpayer is almost 3,000 pounds. Whereas start driving an electric car, okay, it's got a slightly higher um, value, cash value, but the benefit in kind is um, going to be 2% from April. Actually, it was 0% to, uh, last tax year, which is quite amazing. But it's going to be 2% from April. So the benefit charge will be 620, and therefore for a 40% taxpayer, £248 a year. So that's quite a staggering reduction, in my opinion, anyway. £219 less income tax payable by the car driver per month. Per month. And also there is associated benefit for the company or the employer in the sense that the contribution for national insurance, the Class 1A NI charge, is also based on those big values. So obviously that will be a saving for the business as well. So that's capital allowances. R&D was the other thing I said I'd talk about. So again, big topic. Hopefully people are very aware of this. This is only available for companies, not for individuals or partnerships. And essentially it's a tax system looking to give a uh, relief and reward for business, businesses who are being innovative, coming up with new, new ways in which they are driving the boundaries of science and technology. Now, I think there's a misconception here, and I think I've talked to many businesses and they think R&D is about either putting man on the moon or curing cancer and it isn't actually it's far wider than that and I would kind of challenge you all to say even in a manufacturing type business you are probably encountering R&D type activity without even realizing it you know, are you pushing the boundaries of science and technology where you are faced with an issue that you need to resolve and at the outset the uncertainties are you haven't been able to overcome those uncertainties. You don't know the answer. And it's not simply something you can look on Dr. Google. You have to basically work through. So if you are developing those type of processes, then it may well be you are eligible for R&D tax relief. Now, again, in a, a net zero context, I've, I've worked with architects here where we're looking at bringing in sustainable building practices, so using sustainable material, looking at reducing waste, or even um, looking at things like energy efficiency. So I think someone mentioned this morning about LED lighting. I worked with an architect who was developing, trying to get his head around developing a system that enabled um, more beneficial lighting into a particular um, design that was done in a way that actually was kind of never been done before and that actually itself qualified for R&D. So as wide application in the construction sector um, and in just general new building techniques and, and, and processes. There's two types of R&D. There's one um, for the SME world, and there's a slightly less advantageous one for the bigger companies, the RDEC, which is the Research and Development Expenditure Credit Scheme. The, the one I'd suggest probably is the most relevant in this room is the SME, and that's if you have a business that's less than 500 employees, essentially you're gonna be within the SME rules, subject to some other conditions. What does that mean? Well, it gives you an extra 130% deduction, so you get a 230% deduction in total for all qualifying spend. Um, if you are in a loss-making position or by claiming the R&D tax credit, it turns you into a loss position for tax, then you can actually cash those, cash, you can cash your chips in um, and you can have essentially that back as a, an immediate cash refund. Not at the 19% that you'd be paying, but at 14.5%. But still, in some businesses, certainly over the last few years, that has been a lifeline. If you're in the bigger scheme, then less generous, it's 13%, and it's called above the line. Essentially means it's taxable. So take off 19% take off CT, and you're down to about 10.5%. Um, what qualifies quickly? Um, so when you are going through a process of trying to develop and push the boundaries of science and technology within your company, the main cost will be people. So you get tax relief for your gross uh, employment costs, for your employer's NI, for your pension contributions, um, any subcontract costs that you have to buy in to help you, you get relief for that at 65%. And then just other categories like software licensing and consumables, you get relief there as well. 
Obviously, you have to do a proper cost of exercise. You have to show to HMRC that you are um, generally incurring R&D um, and, and therefore provide that narrative to them. But in my opinion, having seen many of these, if you construct your report and provide the narrative in a way that HMRC expect you to and kind of answers all of their questions, R&D is something that you really should be looking at and taking the benefit of within your, within your business. Um, there's a process to go through that. You have to do that within your CT600, which is your corporation tax return. So it has to be done as part of your compliance process. And essentially, you have two years. So you have your normal year end. You have a year to submit your accounts and tax comp, then a year then in which to make a further claim if you wish to. That's it. I'm getting the sign to get off. So um, what I was going to say when I wrote these slides three weeks ago, I was going to challenge you to say, you know, are you a business that, that kind of takes decisions net of tax? Not that tax should ever wag the dog, of course. Um, but I, having sat here today, I don't need to convince anybody of the commercial imperative to actually follow a net zero agenda. It's just that actually we can sweeten the pill. Thank you very much for listening. I'll just say sorry. Um, further details uh, of me at the Mercer Hall website, please have a look. There's lots of material on there. Thank you very much.